Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. On tonight's show, we'll have a story from Inside Energy. But first, Matt O'Lean sits down and gets a chance to talk with Prairie Public's own Scott Previs. Coming up later on Prairie Pulse, we'll have an Inside Energy story from Colorado, but first our guest is Prairie Public's own Scott Prebus, who hosts Prebus on Classics weekday mornings, 9 a.m. to noon on Prairie Public's radio service. Hi, Scott. Matt, how are you? Glad, glad to be here with you. Wanted to get you on for a long time, and uh, first just tell folks about your background, where you're from originally, and how you got involved in music. Well, I'm from northern Indiana, a town called South Bend. South Bend is about 80 miles east of uh, Chicago. Notre Dame. Notre Dame, right. Lived a couple blocks from Notre Dame. and. Uh, uh, South Bend, uh, I had the great fortune of growing up in South Bend when it was a wonderful musical city. Uh, I've always, had always wanted to play drums. Uh, my parents were always supportive, but didn't want me to necessarily play drums. So I started out on trombone, knocked out some front teeth in a bicycle accident, couldn't play a wind instrument anymore. And my parents started bringing home an assortment of instruments to play. Uh, I hated all of them, the violin, the accordion. Um, a little a ukulele once, even. <laughs> we, we know your feelings on ukuleles. Yes. You've made that clear. And um, <laughs> it was very fortunate that they finally said, okay. And so I got to study with a wonderful teacher. He's uh, still performing, I think, at the age of 87. His uh, name is Eddie Knight. And he was Dinah Shore's drummer. And when Eddie got married, uh, Dinah Shore asked him to, his wife asked him to get off the road with Dinah Shore. And he was a South Bend native, and uh, that was it. And and that was it. Turned me on to jazz. Turned me on to uh, being a percussionist. Uh, wonderful teacher, and I think that's so important to everybody to have a good teacher. And then it just fell into line from there. I went to school in uh, Indiana State University, University of Colorado, for my master's. I uh, did some summer work at Eastman School of Music. And one thing evolves into another, and as you know, in music, you can take many career paths, mm -hmm. and uh, jazz kind of fell into that, that whole thing, although I was trained as a classical player. Um, and being a percussionist is always a lifelong enlightenment because there are so many instruments and so many ethnic cultures that comprise percussion. It's, it's always been very interesting. So I was in higher education for most of my time. Got the uh, great opportunity to uh, perform quite a bit, uh, especially in the days when jazz performance was more ubiquitous than it is now. And uh, I wouldn't give up those memories for anything. Well, it's been Prairie Public's gain to get you as a host of Prebus on Classics. Talk about the approach to your show and how you approach your show every day. Well, you know, there's so much diversity in music now, Nat, Matt, that um, I feel like my program is sharing that diversity. So we'll play music from the classical genre, but it might be a quartet, might be a trio. Uh, certainly symphonic classical works comprise a great part of the program. Uh, but we'll certainly feature almost every day brass groups, uh, woodwind ensembles, and we try to keep uh, the program rolling in a forward way manner so that uh, every selection is, is interesting. So we don't, uh, tired of, we want to avoid that fatigue from listeners. And uh, so we try to keep it uh, refreshing, uh, moving forward all the time. And um, the uh, aspect of the position, and by the way, I love being at Prairie Public. It is just such an enlightening Great. environment here that um, uh, the aspect that I found, I found most interesting are the interviews when people come on here and talk about music, whether they're a conductor or a performer. Uh, I have a stated goal of 10 minutes with an interview, and sometimes we've gone as far as 25 because... Uh, it uh, is so enlightening to talk to these people that uh, come to North Dakota and uh, perform for us, and they uh, bring their uh, special talents, you know, to us. It's uh, just been wonderful. Every day, I love driving to work, Good. and uh, it, it's just a real treat. And I, I know you like to bend the classical genre, in your mm -hmm. words, film scores, which we I love too. We did a show together on the film scores, and tell us about that. You really That's really the modern classical music a lot of times, isn't it? I think that's what's saving classical music. You know, uh, th as long as 35, 40 years ago, we were facing the problem of programming how to bring new audiences to classical music. And uh, 
Uh, there would be many symposiums on how to do this. How do we? How are we going to program for orchestras and program for classical music and curricula in school? And I think the film industry kind of took care of that for us. They did not abandon the genre of the large symphony orchestras, but indeed, they attracted this. Um, uh, group of composers who were wonderfully talented, especially in writing for the characters that are in the film. That has become a specialty now of film music. The little motifs that used to be in our heads are now on film. And that's a terrific thing to see how they, uh, they do that. Just a few minutes ago, I finished um, a program with uh, John Williams. Mm -hmm. And those, all those characters from the Harry Potter films were so wonderfully depicted in his musical scores that it's, um, it's absolutely amazing that today we can combine vision, ears, and mind with that. And it's a wonderful time to be living. It really is in terms of music. Who are some, who are some of your favorite film score composers? Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Uh, I, I think there's, if there's anybody that speaks to my heart, at least Hans Zimmer just... Uh, and I, I have to occasionally say I'll be in master control doing my show and I'll listen to some music uh, by Hans Zimmer. Um, sometimes you get that little tear yeah, yeah, down your eye, yeah. you know, because it's just, uh, it's just his music is so effective. Of course, John Williams has spawned, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so many. Howard Shore yeah. is another one that's just taken this beautiful landscape of New Zealand right. and the, the vast... Uh, story that's Lord of the Rings and uh, compress that into a score that addresses everything there. And it's just wonderfully creative music. How Love about, it. How about classical composers? Who are some of your favorites there? Well, uh, there I tend to be more of a traditionalist. Uh, uh, I make it a rule every day to have at least Mozart or Haydn on, uh, certainly Beethoven. Uh, never get tired of the music. It, it, it's always refreshing. With Haydn, there is such a vast amount of music in so many genres, from string quartet to uh, uh, solo work, piano to symphonic orchestra. Uh, we're never at a shortage. Um, little Mozart, and they all learned from each other. You know, they all studied from each other. And to watch the um, the progression from Haydn to Mozart to Beethoven musically is a real wonderful thing. You can hear the impact that each had uh, on the other as, as we develop this music. Of course, when we get to the Romantic period, um, so much of that music is it, it going in a completely different direction that it's, it's another breathtaking tour of, here we go again, mm -hmm. uh, put your seatbelt on and, and uh, enjoy the ride. Now you taught for years, of course. What was your approach to teaching students music? Well, I did not use a textbook approach. Uh, the music is, is always there. And so we have to learn, especially in performance, to uh, understand the music and understand what you're performing. And there's a combination there between performing music and entertaining people. Mm -hmm. And I always kind of weighed that evenly because if I've always felt that there's no such thing as a bad audience, that if an audience isn't reacting to your performance, then you're doing something wrong, whether it's, uh, whether it's visible or um, uh, on stage, your presentation or your interpretation of the music or just the shaping of the music. Quite often because of the pressures of education today, people have to go on stage and perform before it's really ready for performance mm -hmm. because we have dates and calendars. And so the, probably the biggest challenge for me was getting the best performance at the date that you needed to do it and make sure that you were at the top of the wave, that you were at the crest and that music was ready to be heard. Because sometimes, um, I was just out working with a group last night and um, they're not quite there. They've got a, a performance in about four days, and so we talked about understanding the music and, and those last four days being spent on getting uh, ready for that performance. But sometimes uh, younger musicians are imbued with nervousness mm -hmm. about going on stage right. and performing, and they're really thinking about themselves and not the impact that they're making on an audience, and um, that's paramount. So a lot of time was spent doing that stage preparation for students. I've been blessed to just have wonderful students. Uh, 
it's just uh, we still stay in touch with them and uh, it, it's just been a remarkable as I look back on education it's the kids that have been just dynamite and they continue to grow as I continue to still grow in this uh, profession they are too and it's kind of wonderful to see that yeah you and I have chatted about the movie Whiplash which I know you haven't seen but you've seen enough of J.K. Simmons' mm -hmm. Oscar-winning turn. Is that an over-the-top portrayal of teachers, or have you encountered teachers like that? That was the and norm. Where, where is, and where's the line yeah. that gets crossed, right? Yeah, that was the norm academies. when I was coming okay. up. It's completely different now. Uh, you, in comparison, you only have to look, uh, take a look at one of the great band leaders, Buddy Rich, to understand it does not take too much time spent with Buddy Rich to understand that he control, completely controlled the band. It was a band that he ran. Every nuance on stage was controlled by Buddy Rich. And if you wanted to be in that wonderful band, you did what he, and, and I think this film is an accurate portrayal okay. of that. Um, some of those great composers, um, Buddy Rich and uh, Stan Kenton, and they ruled with an iron fist, but they had these great groups. You know, Artie Shaw, right. another one. Right. Um, and those bands were magnificent. Not to say you can't do it the other way. You know, uh, Woody Herman and Maynard Ferguson mm -hmm. had bands where they were compatible with the performers. Uh, near the end, both of those bands had kids that were 20, 30 years younger than they were, and they were very compatible with them. But mm -hmm. you kind of have to pick how you're going to do it. Um, in some ways, I think today everybody is so relaxed and, and well, you know, that's okay. Good it job. Yeah. That's yeah. what Simmons says. <laughs> Two worst words in the English language. Absolutely. Good job. I, I have to say, I, I agree with him on that a hundred percent, you know. Uh, so maybe dinosaurs, but I hope not. I hope not. But, um, I have to agree with him and, you know, uh, thousands of books have been written about players paying their dues to get on stage and play. And that thing of spending, that aspect of spending years and years in the practice room and shedding and uh, notes and technique to get to this point, I think we've kind of lost some of that now. And it's sad to see. But the movie I'm looking forward to see. Okay. See. Well, talk about the pressure kids are under at these big music academies. Is that, it's, it's, Kind of like being a major college football player, I suppose. Well, I think that's, yeah. absolutely, that's a great analogy. Kids want to get to a certain point. Performers, I should say, want to get to a certain point. And quite often, they underestimate the amount of time and, and work it takes to get to that point. So quite often, people walk through the doors of the major conservatories, the, the Eastmans mm -hmm. and the Berkeleys and the Miamis, uh, thinking, well, all I have to do is go to school and... I'll walk out and, and it'll Get be job, there. Right. And um, uh, they encounter, well, I've got to learn this and this and this, and it's not about what you want to learn, but it's about what you have to do to get there. And, and quite frankly, it's exactly like athletics, is at some point you've got to come to grips with where you want to go and where you are. And for some people, they're not going to make it. Um, and for other people, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And that point in your life is really interesting for mm -hmm. many, many performers of what am I going to give up? What am I going to have to sacrifice? And in the movie, I believe it's uh, when he's told that the young drummer has to uh, break up with his girlfriend yes. because I don't have time right. to work in my career and have a relationship with you. That's not unheard of. You know, so yeah. uh, can't wait to see the film. Tell me about some of your highlights playing in jazz festivals. I know you like to do that and you've gotten to play in some big ones. I uh, love doing that. I uh, still have the time now. Uh, I schedule four a year, um, and uh, it's great. It takes me all over the place. Last year, I went to uh, Banff and um, Ottawa and Idaho uh, and Kansas City, and each of those four locales is different. Kansas City is still a hotbed for jazz. Mm -hmm. When you go to Kansas City, I always have to take about a month and really woodshed before I go down there because... It's, uh, I think, one of the greatest cities in the country for playing jazz. And there's jazz every night in Kansas City. It's just wonderful. And, and uh, players who still play the blues in a meaningful way. I mean, they really play. Um, Banff, 
brings together uh, great players from all over Canada, younger players, high school and college players. And uh, four or five of us get to adjudicate them and listen to them. And these are the top-notch bands in Canada. And um, I, I simply, when I'm flying home from that, I'm just astounded with the level of ability. 17-year-old uh, kids playing like they're 40 years old. You know, I mean, there's that kind of dedication going on. We did uh, some concerts in Idaho last summer um, with my colleague Jim Mayer uh, playing on the Snake River Canyon. And I can't think of a more beautiful yeah. setting to be outside playing with a packed audience and 100 feet away is the Snake River Canyon and the sun setting. It's just nothing in life. Um, I kind of don't ever want to give up the performance aspect, at least to do a few of those every year because it's just marvelous. It, it straightens out this, it, you return to where music really is in the heart. And I have to say the collaboration on stage in jazz, as well as classical music too, uh, you are, never feel life more than when you're on stage and the mics are on and you're playing together. I mean, you, the sensory input of other musicians sharing that with you is, is remarkable. It, it's still, I never get tired of it. Yeah. On your show, what kind of feedback do you get from listeners? And do you get suggestions and incorporate those in the show? Uh, I do. Uh, the people have been absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, it's, it's heartwarming. And I have to tell you once again, sometimes I open up cards from people and I get that little tear mm -hmm. because you just don't, I'm doing a show for my, you know, I, I do this every day. I walk into the studio I spend afternoons programming, but you get these uh, notes from people and these emails that uh, how much you mean to them and the programming or the comments that you say. And again, it's, um, I've always, I mean, I work full time for Prairie Public now, but I've always, for 15 years, I was a guest host, mm -hmm. uh, volunteer, and uh, it's always been important. And that for me is the closest link, and people love classical music. I mean, it is, it is just astounding. Uh, for so many people, it's relaxing. It takes them away from the turmoil of life, the traffic, uh, everything we deal with, and it's their escape. So I kind of every day make sure that I have room in my show to provide that escape for people who just want to relax, breathe a little easier, um, enjoy their cup of tea or coffee, and just listen to good music. Unfortunately, uh, much of our audience is an older audience, yeah. and I strive really hard. And that's the struggle, isn't it? The young yeah. kids, right? Yeah, it's not as complicated as you think. It, okay. it's, it's real close to the heart. And uh, for young people, you just have to take the time to listen because it's there. And um, uh, kids are always, and I think that's the importance of going back to the film genre, is the kids see this and they go, wow, it's a symphony orchestra. And they've never heard a symphony orchestra. And so it's, it's a short step from having kids listen to John Williams to Mozart. So it's, uh, it's, it's wonderful still connecting to those people. So classical won't die. You think it'll be around because of films and kids still, kids still want those music careers too. I think that's why we keep using the large symphony orchestras as the uh, genre of choice in the film industry. It's still going to be by and large and if it didn't work they wouldn't use the big orchestras and uh, that is the most effective medium for connecting emotion with that vast amount of instruments that you have everything from piccolo to strings to bassoon to oboe to trumpet I mean any emotion that you want to convey can be conveyed through the orchestration in the hands of a good composer Got about 20 seconds again. When does the show air and how can people get a hold of you? Where can they go? Well, we're on 9 to 12 weekday mornings, Central Time. I am always here at sprevis at prairiepublic.org. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. A pleasure, Matt. Scott Prebis, Prebis on Classics on Prairie Public. Stay tuned for more. While many renewable energy projects may face tighter budgets and greater scrutiny under the new Congress, hydropower enjoys wide bipartisan support. This past year, two important pro-hydro bills were passed that streamlined the process for installing small-scale power projects on existing hydro infrastructure. Here is a view from a small hydro product 
on an historical mill site in southwestern Colorado. This is what a lot of us think of when we hear the word hydropower. But in a lot of ways, this is the old face of hydro in the U.S. And this is the new face. So Ben, this is all it is. This is it? A generator the size of a wheelbarrow, pulling in water from a mountain stream, generating enough power for about 10 homes. This little generator has helped change the course of hydro history. Come on, really? This little tiny thing in a five foot by 10 foot building is causing all of this? <laughs> Beverly Rich and other members of the volunteer San Juan County Historical Society started taking care of this old mill site about 15 years ago. A mill with a water pipeline the workers used decades ago to help process precious metals like gold and silver. At that time, we kept thinking, gee, there really ought to be a way that we can use that water. They started trying to get the federal licensing needed to install a power generator. And had no idea how um, really onerous it is for really tiny, tiny little projects. Uh, we were having to jump through the same hoops that if you were going to build Boulder Dam. That's the old name for the Hoover Dam. And she's not exaggerating. A lot of projects generating electricity from water had to go through the same federal scrutiny as the giant dams of old. That is, until August of 2013. The other bill under consideration today is hydropower legislation. Advocates of small hydropower projects worked up a pair of bills for Congress, and the mill project in Silverton was on full display as a prime example of their problem. It's a long overdue, cost-effective, common-sense measure. This legislation streamlined the federal licensing process for small hydropower projects, cutting it down from years to as little as 60 days. And the legislation didn't just pass. Incredibly enough, in this, um, this uh, horrible time of gridlock, it passed unanimously. The bills hit this rare bipartisan sweet spot, says energy analyst Cameron Brooks. For Republican lawmakers, the legislation shrank federal bureaucracy. It's really cutting through red tape and helping um, push forward something that can create jobs. And for Democrats, it meant a win for renewable energy, and most importantly, doing so without putting new dams on America's rivers. The result? More small projects like the one in Silverton are getting approved more quickly. So for the small hydropower industry, national lawmakers really did their job. There are still problems for hydro, though. And so advocates are still looking for more from Capitol Hill. This is a great example of an enormous amount of mechanical energy which is currently being completely wasted. Hydropower consultant Kirk Johnson testified at the congressional hearing on the 2013 bills. As helpful as he thinks that legislation was, he compares it to gently taking a kitchen knife to the government's red tape. We need another round of legislation perhaps to get a machete and further clear out some of those regulatory barriers. For starters, hydropower advocates want bigger production tax credits, like wind power used to enjoy. But those credits came to an end at the end of last year, and many Republicans expressed reservations in continuing them further. Also, as far as Johnson is concerned, for little generators like the mill in Silverton, it shouldn't just be a matter of reducing the licensing process. If projects are tiny and non-controversial, why is the federal government involved at all? Legislation to ease hydropower expansion will likely make a reappearance in the new Congress. Why? Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski has taken over as the new Republican chair of the Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources. She's on record as a hydro booster, saying it's an underdeveloped resource and could do more to support economic development and job creation. As far as the country's energy needs, there is vast potential. This is Button Rock Dam in northern Colorado. There's no generator hooked up here. If there were... That would generate enough electricity to power about 500 average local homes. And that project would still be considered small hydropower. Projects more than twice as big are still lumped in as small. 
There are some 80,000 dams in this country. Small and medium sized and giant. Right now, only 3% are being used to generate hydropower. So there's a lot of room for growth, equal to the power generated by about a dozen coal-fired power plants. Dan Boyce in Denver for the PBS NewsHour. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Inside Energy is a project of Prairie Public in cooperation with public broadcasters in Colorado and Wyoming. Funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. See more at InsideEnergy.org. And by the members of Prairie Public.